And I'll say, by the way, Bart is very humble. You know, I went to that event. Out of everyone there, I was like, yo, I want to talk to this mother. Ah, the dumbest one there? No, the coolest guy there. <laughs> what what was it. he doing that made him look so cool? Yo, he, he was just sort of just being an introvert. I hope yeah. no one talks to me. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Care for Boys, where today we have a special guest with us, Mr. Eric Way. Thank, thank you, gents. Thank you, thank you for the applause. It's how I like to start my day. It's uh, excited it to be good, here. Feels good, right? Yeah, yeah. I feel nice. special. I feel validated. <laughs> you know what's pretty funny is um, I had no idea you guys knew each other, right? And then last minute we get the call sheet, and he goes, "Hey, uh, prepare questions for like crypto, finance, whatever." I got my buddy Eric coming, and I'm all like, "Oh, okay." And I see you, and I'm like. I watched a video with you about a month ago where you were talking about, man, I forgot exactly what it was, but the setting was like a very bright room. There was like a glass behind you. It was like a podcast. It was like, um, and then you're with another Asian dude, I nice. think, right? Of course, I try. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not the Asian. <laughs> you were talking about, um, Oh, Finance. this is Jay, Jay Hoovy. <coughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. And we, super overexposed backgrounds for our podcast. But it was yeah. super bright. Yeah, it was yeah, super, super bright. We, we, we looked yeah, angelic. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, don't, you don't actually want to shoot like that. Tons of natural light. Yeah, he's a buddy of mine. He, like me, comes from a finance background. And then both of us realized ah. that I hate this and became entrepreneurs. Yes. Great. Okay, yeah, that was cool. That was yeah. cool. Yeah. Because um, I was getting into M&A at the time. I'm not working on a deal. So I was just searching for like you know, people out there that aren't just finance gurus that are motivating you, but yeah. give you real shit. Ah. And then your video popped up and I was like, that was freaking cool. And I think it was about how to get financing and stuff like that, right? I forgot exactly there, there, that. Or might have, there've been a couple, maybe okay. one of them was. Um, but wow, that's super wild. I'm, yeah. I'm glad, like, so I walked in, you're like, this, this guy, what's yeah. he doing here? <laughs> but I wanted to save it for the camera so people, you know. Yeah, so I met him at a Vegas YouTube event. As you guys know, Vegas is popping off with YouTube. Shut it's like, that's up. what- Shut the fuck, the fuck up. up. So cool. <laughs> so I met him there, and then I was like, oh, like, what are you doing? He was explaining to me about all, like, you went to Harvard, right? Yes, I did. Like, all this fucking, like, you know when, like, you talk to someone, you literally just start getting dumber? Because yeah. you're like, yeah. this guy's, a fucking genius, and I don't know fucking shit. And then he told me about the company Carrot that he started, and so we connected from there. And then because of all the crazy like crypto um, stuff that's going on right now, I thought it'd be cool to have him on to maybe explain some of those things. But before we get into that, could you explain a little bit about your own personal journey? Because yeah, it's really absolutely. cool too. And I'll say, by the way, Bart is very humble. You know, I went to that event. Out of everyone there, I was like, yo, I want to talk to this motherfucker. The dumbest one there? No, the coolest guy there. <laughs> what were, what was it. he doing that made him look so cool? Yo, he, he was just sort of just vibing on the chair. Like, like, yeah, 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 Being yeah. an introvert. I hope yeah. no one talks yeah. to me. <laughs> <laughs> Just like gathered around, they're like, oh, oh hey, hey, are you? And I, I see he's just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I see that look. I'm like, I'm like that's, that's my guy. So you didn't see that as unapproachable? No, see, the thing I learned in the room any room you enter, you want to go to the unapproachable motherfucker. And you find out either he's dumb as fuck or he's super cool. It's got to be both. one of those. <laughs> <laughs> know, maybe, maybe, Sometimes you but, get lucky and yeah. get yeah, the I, yeah. Started, yeah. I started talking with him, and I know we got a little bit, we had like, Five solid minutes before they're like, yo, someone's talking. But we got into life story a bit, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it's really good vibe. So for background for you guys, I was originally born in Canada because I had Chinese parents who came over to the States. They couldn't stay here. They went to Canada. And I grew up next to a nuclear power plant. My dad oh. used to work there as a scientist. And he was poor as fuck. He made like $20,000 a year. So he switched jobs, brought me to the States. 20,000 in Canada too. So yeah, Canada is like 15, 10K. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. As a scientist, that's crazy. But let me make my sob story even worse. It was Canadian dollars. Yeah. That's like 15K. Yeah, they got like the moose pennies and everything, Damn. you know? They're cute, but. Damn. So he brought me over to the States. I grew up in Indiana and New Jersey, and he got a job in finance. And eventually, by the end of high school, we weren't poor anymore. So I was like, yo, I got to do what my dad did, you know, the whole journey of the immigrant story. I got to represent, I got to get a job in finance. Plus my dad, he never talked to me about anything around girls or how to grow as a man. It was always about economics, about Wall Street, about discount cash flow models. I knew what a discount cash flow model was before I ever learned the birds and the bees. I don't even know what the yeah, fuck that what? is. You don't, need, you don't need to know. You should definitely learn about women saying. instead. Bart doesn't know if you found out what we did, you'd have a heart attack on how much we spent 
on degenerate shit. But you were probably way cooler because what <laughs> happened was <laughs> I didn't know <laughs> any of that. Wait until we buy that Sizzlers. Yeah. So I worked super hard in school. I was like, yo, my goal, I gotta get into Harvard. And wow. I'll be real with you Is that you the guys. number one business school or finance school? I, you know, a little, little town in Cambridge, Cambridge, Boston, Massachusetts, you know, my parents like, you go there, you do good. The sad thing was I, I took that upon myself and I was like, yo, it's do this or bust. Like if I don't make it a Harvard, I'm gonna kill myself because of how important that was in my life. Because how trained I was as that kid growing up to be like, this is the meaning of why you have been brought onto this earth wow. to make your parents proud, to make Jeez. everyone else proud. Wow. So dude, it fucking sucked. I got depressed <laughs> as hell. Yeah. Cause I finally got in and guess what? Anytime you set you up for a milestone like that, as soon as you hit it, yeah. You find out it lasts like for 15 seconds. Right. You feel good when you open the the letter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, then, That's and then you get there. <laughs> yeah, you have to. Yeah, and then and then it's the come down. Then you're just like. Mm. And the bitches are ugly. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's exactly. Yeah, 15 seconds of pure joy, and then long minutes of regret. So I, I was there, and I said, I worked my whole life to get here, but that was my meaning. What am I supposed to do now? Now a. Smarter man would have had some self reflection and figured out, you know, I should figure out self validation, what I actually care about, the things I like to do even if nobody else cares. Yeah. I was dumb, so I just said, What's the next Harvard? I said, All right, oh. time to go into Wall Street. Oh, so wow. I did that for another three years. Oh, shit. I worked at Blackstone, and I had the same what? stupid thing happen. <laughs> what? I got there, I was working Damn. there, and I was like, This is shit, too. <laughs> so I got my What were you doing at uh, Blackstone? So I worked in this group, it's called Restructuring and Reorganization. That meant when companies went bankrupt, our job was to help carve up the pieces and make sure that everyone felt happy again. Cause like, say you run, I'm gonna make this up. Say you run like a beef jerky company. And I actually did look at a beef let's jerky say, Let's company. say you run a fitness brand. Yeah, let's say, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Hypothetical, let's say you run a fitness yeah. brand, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly, we'll, we'll, we'll call it like, a, I don't know, Dumbbell Gang or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Dumbbell Gang. Dumbbell Gang. Yeah, That's yeah. a way sicker name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel you passed on that. <laughs> and, and say that you took out, let's make this up. Say you took a million dollars out in loans to fund this business, mm -hmm. and you took a million dollars out in equity. So at the end of, say, five years, you're just like, yo, I can't do this anymore. And the company's assets are only worth $500,000. So you got a million dollars in obligations from debt holders. You got a million you gave to equity holders. There's only 500K. How's it split up? So that's where they bring us in. First of all, everyone who invests in the equity, you get shit. You get nothing. Right. Because there's not even enough money to pay back the debt holders. Because the, the debt, debt holders get paid back first? Yes, exactly. There's Whoa. a seniority structure. But even the debt holders, you go to them and it's like, hey, like, you know, I could just sell off my assets and get you 500000 or 50 cents on the dollar. Or I'll give you 20 cents on the dollar now, right? So I'll give you even less. I wouldn't give you 500000 I'll give you 200000 But with that remaining 300000 I think I can still operate the business. And I got a shot and I'll convert the rest of your debt into equity so we can keep going. So there's all these sorts of negotiations when, <laughs> hey, you know, you owe someone money and you're trying to figure out who gets what or like, can I still run my company and convince them to change that into equity? Another great example is one of our clients we worked there, it was like a Native American casino. And like that's if it's really tricky because like if a Native American casino goes bankrupt, all the debt holders, you try and go after them in court, Native Americans run their own country. They're sovereign. Oh. So they can be like, sure, according to United States law, I'm supposed to honor your debts, but according to Native American law, we are our own nation and we don't need to. We dance our mm. debts away. Yeah, well, you know, it's the sort of thing where you gotta respect me, man. My people came here before you. Damn. I ain't gonna pay you shit. And then, and then it becomes a negotiation because yeah. if every Native American casino did this, no one would ever lend them money. Mm. So they have right. to give something. They can't just say, fuck off. They gotta be like, Look, I don't have to honor anything, but you know, in respect of the fact that I want you to one day to give me money again, I'll give you something. Mm. So it was our job to come in and figure out this negotiation. Interesting. So that's 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 that was Blackstone. That. Yeah, exa exactly. And so I, the clients I worked with, um, it was all, it's funny because it's all situations that you see the 10, 15 different ways companies go bankrupt. So like I worked on, for example, an ambulance provider that went bankrupt because Guess what? When you're stabbed in the street and you die in con ambulance, you're not allowed as the ambulance provider to be like, you don't got money. I can't take you. Yeah, they all have to take you. Yeah, they, 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 they have yeah. to take you. But what if you can't get paid? 
Mm. Which a lot of the times, no, yeah. Exactly. There's Medicare, there's Medicaid, yeah. but like sometimes as an ambulance provider, you're always chasing late payments because yeah. people need you yeah. and they can't pay. Another example, I worked with this company. They bought us all the Spectrum. So Spectrum is what you have to buy bands of frequencies where you can transmit radio waves or television. Well, not the company cellular. Spectrum? Not the company Spectrum. Okay. It's a different company. They bought up all the Spectrum they thought one day could be used for like, you know, cell phones, cellular, internet, and things right. like that. And the one day the FCC came in and said, nah, this Spectrum, it's too close to what we use for emergency distress bands. So the oh. rights to this bands of frequency that you paid millions of dollars for, that your entire company was founded around, you don't get to use it. Wow. Just one single regulatory ruling like that. And then the company's like, well, shit. Damn. Now we go bankrupt. So it's wow. up to you guys to try to restructure somehow? Yeah, because they've raised lots of equity, they've raised lots of debt. And you try and figure out, is there a way that the company can still remain a going concern, that they can still operate, that we can negotiate with the debt holders and be like, look, you don't want to force this company to liquidate because then you get nothing. You get this much. Versus if you're willing to dance with us a bit, you, you, you got this right. much. But do you guys already have interest in these companies and, and your shareholder, that's why you need to help restructure and all that stuff? Or are they coming to you guys for help? Yes, they're coming to us for help. Gotcha. So in the restructuring business, you're either helping the debtor, the company that went bankrupt, or you're on the side of the creditor. You're on the side of the people who gave the bankrupt company money, trying right. to get you know as they're much really as you yeah. can exactly so why was how come blackstone was such a bad experience because you're making it sound pretty sick right now <laughs> so, so so intellectually it was actually fascinating yeah, yeah, yeah. but for me i was like i don't feel like i'm doing anything tangible oh i'm looking at spreadsheets i'm moving numbers around and the bitches weren't hot well, <laughs> you know then they talk about in the banking business they say bottles and models well they don't tell you the bottles are just sparkling water the models are just excel that's all you're gonna end up to. That's wow. very, very clear. The funny thing though, actually, there's a certain culture, a certain machismo, where, you know, the first time I ever drank alcohol my entire life was on that Black Sun internship because the managing director, the vice president, they took us out to the club. Because, you know, you're in New York, that's what you do to be cool. Right. And the vice president gave us all tequila shots. And I was so scared of losing that job offer that was the first time I ever drank alcohol. I was in a club. Oh, wow. Did you get wasted? Oh no, I had, I mean, you know, I'm a lightweight, but I, I can do one shot, right? So I, I had that one shot, it was 15 other guys, and it was because I felt like I had to do it in order And they didn't even know employed. how special that was? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, like, you don't even understand, this is a big moment for you guys, I want you to know. So at least do the arm thing. Yeah, yeah, you know what you're doing? I, I just, because, because guys, I was trying to be cool, so I pretended, yeah, yeah, right. oh yeah, I, I do these all the yeah. time. And you're like, oh God, why did it hurt so much? <laughs> God, <laughs> so, I mean, so many people, so many of you guys probably have good memories of drinking for your first time. May maybe, I don't know, right? Yeah. With friends, with women, with family. With me? No, no. <laughs> it was terrible. That'd be great if all 12 of you guys, it was your first time and you're all faking it. Oh my god, that would, that would have been, you know, I'll tell you this. The analyst class above me were these incredibly good looking, six foot three, super jacked guys. And then my analyst class, we're a bunch of nerds. And we literally were like, is this diversity in hiring? Where they're like, <laughs> <laughs> we bring in like the super sharp, like yeah. presidential Paul Bunyans. Right. And then when we bring in like- The Winklevoss yeah, twins. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then yeah. You, you bring in, you got Winklevoss and you bring in like, you know, essentially the, the tiny like Asian guy. <laughs> I don't know how to throw a catch of ball, but you like balance that out. So that, that's what I felt like. And, I realized for me, I wanted to do something that was more tangible. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do something that was more of my own. I didn't like the culture, the machismo, because I spent so much time, you know, learning to feed off the validation of others. Mm -hmm. It's a really toxic environment where that yeah. validation of others is leading you down a path that's really different from you. Mm -hmm. oh, but yeah. I was still oh, yeah. scared because, you know, my dad was proud of me. I want my dad yeah. to be proud of me. So I actually verbally said yes. I never signed anything, but verbally I said, yeah, I'll take the offer to return. And I thought about it, and at the end of summer break, I said, no, I don't want to go back. And I had to call them and be like, you know, I know I told you guys yes and I appreciate it. And look, on the whole, they were they were good to me. You know, they were, it just wasn't the right fit for me, but they, they did good stuff. And I called and be like, I'm not coming back. And they were just like, what the fuck, man? And I was like, look, I just, I can't do this. And so I graduated, I switched jobs. I worked in management consulting for a bit, which is like 90% the same stuff as I just said. Mm -hmm. It's like companies bring you in to help them figure out how to make more profit. How do I decrease my losses? How do I hire more people, let go of people? 
and I spent a couple years, it's all sorts of companies. I helped a makeup company in New York City, that's my first project. Help a company doing security systems. And about three months in though, I actually got an offer from Facebook to go join them as a product manager. Because even there, I knew pretty quickly, this was still too far removed from actually making stuff. But when I got that offer, I was still scared. So I went and talked to all my mentors and advisors, and I didn't realize, when you ask people for advice, they tell you what they did or what they wish they had done. Mm -hmm. It's never based on you, it's based on them. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone I was talking to, they were in the consulting finance industries. Yeah. So they're like, well, of course you gotta stay. You look like a dumb fuck if you leave McKinsey after three months to go work at Facebook. Mm -hmm. So I stayed, I did my full two years, and then I went to Facebook anyways. And I did the exact same job. I went back to them, like, guys, I'm sorry, I said no. Will you still take me? They said, yeah. But I came into the same role I would have been, but probably like $100,000 poorer, because at a company like Facebook, it was growing so fast, right. it was like 2014. Wow. Coming in two years later, makes a huge Damn. difference. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I liked it there, and I ended up at Instagram, and I helped build Instagram Live, I was working with creators and businesses. And you know, for me, honestly, one of the reasons why I was so excited to be here, it is a crazy concept to me that anyone thinks that I am now worth listening to or watching, that I get to sit here and be on camera. Because you know, growing up, I didn't see anybody on camera. You guys were very early, but a lot of Asians weren't so much as present. Yeah. And I always wanted to do creative stuff, media stuff, but I never recognized that need in myself. Oh. So I was working with creators at Instagram, and when I left, I was like, you know, I love to be a part of this world. I'm not nearly smart, or clever enough, or cool enough, not like this guy. <laughs> Dumb enough. This guy's pretty cool, dude. Let's, pretty make, cool. let's make sure, he was putting up Bart, yeah, not maybe, no. this guy. Not the, same, not the guy wearing the same thing. <laughs> I mean, you guys are literally you guys are literally dressed together. Yeah, it's cute. I'm wearing his <laughs> brand. Brother, He's yeah. not even wearing his brand. <laughs> Why are you referring your own clothes? I'm on a three sweater rotation, what's your excuse? That's so funny. He's I'm living on my mother-in-law's, where you at, bro? You have a flat. Why are you wearing Carhartt when you have a It's just to show how much cooler this one is. Oh, smart. Oh, that's this business thinking. <laughs> that's hilarious, dude. I don't know the guy who owns Carhartt. I'm not going to wear it, dude. <laughs> it's because he knows. You're, you're, it's like uh, it's like the before and after. Yeah, you're cool. the after. You're the smart guy. That's why you're repping the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Smart guy said I'm a smart guy. That's pretty cool. Hey, can you clip that? Yeah. Yeah. Can, you that yeah. <laughs> can you clip that? Can you put that on Instagram? Can you clip that? No, we're clipping that out. So how'd you end up at Coinbase? So in between all this stuff, figuring what I wanted to do, I knew I wanted to work with creators. So I mm -hmm. left Instagram to do something in the creative world. But before that, I still was afraid not having a steady paycheck. So then I went to Coinbase, because I said to myself, look, I want to do something with creators, I want to do something in the FinTech world, I'm not sure what, let me get another job while I figure out what the next thing is. And I'm like, hey, Coinbase, the entire financial system is broken. Everything in this world is based on someone else deciding, do you get to have money? Like if you think about it, my company now gives creators money. Well, the way it works is there's some really, really rich people who then give money to a fund, who then gives money to a venture capital firm, who then gives money to me so that I can give money to creators. And every single step of that process, someone is extracting a fee. That's why the people in this world who need the money the most have the most trouble getting it because it's so expensive for it to trickle there. Mm -hmm. And I was like fascinated because there's so many demographics that run into this problem. Creators, if you're a solo entrepreneur, if you're an immigrant coming to the country, the whole promise of crypto, the whole promise of the blockchain is there's a decentralized ledger. And all that means is there's not a single central institution deciding whether to float you that payment, to process money coming through into you, whether to give you credit. Instead, it's a sort of free-for-all where everyone can just decide, look, actually, I want to send him 15 bucks. I don't have to, or you know, $15 worth of BTC. I don't have to send that through a central bank that has to decide whether they want to float that payment or if there's risk of chargeback, they're just going to do it. Mm -hmm. And for me, the fundamental promise of crypto was, hey, someone anywhere in this world, if they can get access to a bank account, they can still set up a wallet, they can get access to crypto. And I was like, okay, let me go to a company that's building the picks and shovels, the infrastructure there. So I went and worked at Coinbase. And I learned a ton, and eventually, I was like, hey, this still isn't the same as doing my own thing. So when I finally started my current company, which, yeah, helps creators with finances, with money, I did it with my co-founder, who was running a crypto hedge fund at the time. Initially, we were considering, like, oh, we should do something around crypto. And then we found, and I think this is one of the reasons why crypto adoption is not 100% yet, in financial infrastructure, anything around money, 
Sometimes the real thing is just getting people to learn and trust you. And the thing is creators, they barely even trust normal banks. They barely even understand finance 101. Yeah. So to go to them and be like, ah, but this is crypto, yeah, right. this is better. We're like, that's too much. Yeah. So let's start with the basics. So what we've been doing, we've been building our own underwriting model. How do you solve the problem where there's 15 layers before money gets to the people that need it? The first way is yeah, you flip over the entire table, you reinvent the system, you do crypto. There's no centralized authority. Mm. The second way is doing what we're doing. We're working with an existing financial ecosystem, but we're using our own underwriting model. So we have money from investors, from lenders, and we give that money up to creators to float them on credit or one day to do other things. And if they default, that's on us. We're eating it because we're operating with this existing system, but we are building this really cool underwriting model that, hey, one day in a crypto blockchain world, maybe that becomes useful again. So that's sort of the high level, mm -hmm. how I ended up doing what I'm doing now. And when I mentioned to you, like, hey, this is some of the stuff I do. This is why I was interested in crypto in the first place. I think I yeah. saw a video of you explaining FICO or something. Yeah. You were talking about how like, there's institutions that are deciding whether or not you should be able to borrow. And, totally. Yeah. So as you know, FICO refers to your credit history, which everyone uses to figure out whether you get money. People don't realize FICO, it used to be an acronym because in the 1950s, there were two guys one dude named Fair, the other guy named Isaac. They just made the Fair and Isaac company and said, hey, we'll just develop this as a way for the next 500 years wow. to determine people wow. can pay you back. Internet didn't even exist at that point. If you guys walked, walked up to them and said what you do for a living, they'd be so confused. <laughs> wow. wow. Banks still use that to underwrite <laughs> yeah, yeah. all of you and all of us. And so it's like, well, why hasn't anyone developed a better underwriting model? Hey, when you're a trillion dollar bank and you're that, you know, mid-level Gen Z new banker, do you really want to come in and be like, guys, I have a new idea. It could be really risky, but if it works, I'll move your balance sheet point zero 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 one percent And if it doesn't work, we all look like fucking idiots. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's change the way the underwriting system works. No, that doesn't happen. Which is why it ends up being startups like ours to come in and kind of be like, yeah, let's try and innovate. Let's try and do something a little bit different than FICO. Yeah. 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 I feel like Carrot's super visible now because like most people, I saw it based on everybody posting their Times Thank Square you. building. Oh yeah. yeah. And I was like, I saw that recently. Everybody I know is like yeah. doing this thing. And I'm like, what is this? What is this thing? I wish I knew and about I, yeah. credit and leverage and all that because Everything that we've got into, we literally just saved up and dumped our own capital. So you got you guys bootstrapped everything. That is millions. so fucking hard. It's <laughs> so lost like respect. Yeah. 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 Look at the trauma. <laughs> the pain. I didn't know a lot of these financial like basics. Yeah. Everything is mom and pop. Everything is if you don't have the money, then don't do the venture. Do it, yeah. So yeah. we would just pile up. And, and just angel style, call of all, all of our friends. You want a piece of this? You want to do this? Let's get, let's, let's create this venture or whatever. And like, we just dump money and go. And so now I'm learning about <coughs> getting funded, getting credit. But see, that's the immigrant story in yeah. a way. It's not just, oh, the financial system doesn't understand what we're doing. It's also, we don't know. Like, we didn't grow up with the same knowledge and privilege and context that say generational wealth has here. Yeah. So it's harder for people like us lacking that economy to start new businesses because you literally just put in your own money. Right, and the time yeah. is the biggest yeah. part of it. It's like after a few businesses, you know you can do it, right? So then at that point, it makes more sense to leverage, meaning getting credit or whatever, because you just now you just want to scale. You got a good model and it's like now I need 10 more of the same shop but I need to get that money, but I ran out. So the time in between of opening and scaling and all that stuff, that's when I had to learn like the hard way, picking up books, reading all this shit. I'm just like sounding it out like, da, 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 fa, fa, financial. Like, like, <laughs> <laughs> it takes me forever. Yeah, yeah. But then everything you say, like if I knew this 10 years ago, then I would have been like, Maybe a couple thousand dollars more richer, dude. <laughs> yeah, a couple yeah. stacks. Yeah. Jeez. Well, well, yeah. What was yeah. the very first business venture that you went to? Uh, me and my buddies got together and we started selling um, die cast cars on eBay. And then that from there, we started getting into the airsoft game. And then like 
you know, it was pretty crazy because we just wanted to see where this, this would go. We would, you know, go to yard sales and sell stuff. And this was like, I was like 17 or 18. Yeah. And then we would make a couple hundred bucks. And then one day we were making like 4,000, 6,000, 10,000 even. And we're like, what the hell? These numbers are crazy, right? Because <laughs> like, like you might, you know, my mom was making like 20 grand a year. Like those numbers US, were like, though. <laughs> this is like a twenty Remember your like privilege, Canada. Canada. Canadian. Remember your privilege. Yeah. Yeah. But that was when I was hooked uh, about business. Yeah. And you were like, shit. Like I can just go and make money. Yeah. Fuck yeah. yeah. I don't have to have a job. You don't have to pay tax. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> That's a myth, right? That's, That's a myth, right? <laughs> That's a whole other time. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I, actually, I'm curious for all of you. When was the moment when you realized that same thing? It's a super powerful thing. I didn't get it until five years ago. It's like, wait, I don't have to work a normal job. I can do my own thing. Like th this whole thing here. In part two, we will discuss <laughs> that. Yeah.